I'm going to encourage you, if you will, turn with me in the scripture to 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. Um, I was um, uh, sitting in the back this morning just preparing my heart. I, I, what I'm going to be talking about today is pretty simple. Uh, it's not complicated at all. It's just different than the way we normally think about things, the way we normally think about our relationship with God. And so I don't want you to miss it. Um, and so um, it, it's not complicated, but it may be more difficult to grasp and understand. So I just spent a little extra time this morning asking the Lord to help me communicate in a way that was understandable and life-changing to you. I will meet you there in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 in just a moment. We are currently in a series of messages that we're calling For the One. And it's not just a series of messages. This is our annual church-wide theme for 2020. So you're not only going to be hearing about this for the next few weeks, but you're going to be seeing it over the course of the next year, that we want one more change life, one more story, that everything we do, we serve, we give, uh, we worship, everything we do is for one more person to come into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. But over the course of the few weeks of this series, there are three things that we want awakened inside of your heart. First, we want you to be more aware of God's heart for you, that you are the apple of his eye, that you are the center of his attention, you are his one. But secondly, when you see or hear for the one, we want you to focus on your heart for him. Is he your priority one? And third and ultimately, we want you to sense a deeper burden for people that are far from God. We want you to have a heart for them, um, the people that are far from God, that one that is not in yet in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so here are the visuals today. I've given you this over the last few weeks just so you can see it. For the one, God's heart for you. For the one with a capital O, your heart for him. And then for the one, your heart for them. We spent a great deal of time last weekend focusing on that middle one, your heart for him. We talked about divine order and the principle of first things. And I know that a lot of you have been working on that this week because I've talked to you. Some of you tell me it's entirely recalibrated the first few minutes of your day. And that is a powerful thing. It was only a seven-day challenge that I offered you last week. But I really want to encourage you to keep that practice up until it becomes a habit in your life and changes your pattern of behavior from now on. Now, if you weren't with us last week, I would encourage you to go to the website, northplacechurch.com, and check out last week's message. That message and a host of others are there for you as a free resource to help you in your spiritual growth. But last week's message was incredibly practical, deeply challenging, and I believe it has the potential to be life-changing and transformational. It was simple and yet profound, and I encourage you to check it out. Today, uh, we're gonna, as, we, as we engage this phrase, for the one... I want you to be tuned in to that first one, God's heart for you. The whole story of the Bible is about God's pursuit of us. From the beginning of the Bible to the end, no matter what page you pick, no matter what story you land on, every story in the Bible is one piece of a bigger and broader narrative and if you were to boil that whole narrative down to one phrase, the whole story of God down to one phrase, it is the story of God's passionate pursuit of broken people so he can love us, restore us, and be in a relationship with us. He truly wants to know us. And that's the way I want us to think about God's heart for us. I want, it to, I want us to think about God's heart for us in these terms. If you're a Christ follower, he knows you. Fully, intimately, and personally. But what does it mean to be known by God? Most preaching, most Christian writing, and I would say most of the conversation around Christianity in general is focused on what it means for us to know God, not what it means for God to know us. Matter of fact, we invite people at the end of services or when we're in conversations, we invite people to meet Jesus. We want people to come and know God. And these things are incredibly important. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But there is a great majority, a far greater majority of our effort in time, our thinking, our writing, our preaching is put into us knowing God with very little thought put into what it means to be known by God. In 1976, Henry Blackaby wrote a masterpiece 
that has become a modern classic. It's called Experiencing God. It's not just a book, but it is also a study. And some of you may have done it in a small group at one time or a Sunday school class years ago. It was one of the most formative books that I ever read in my early days of following Jesus Christ. It was a, a key piece in my maturation of, as, a, as a disciple, a follower of Jesus. But even that classic is almost entirely focused on what it means for me to know God. J.I. Packer, one of the world's foremost living theologians, he's currently 93, almost 94 years old, he wrote a book called Knowing God. Christianity Today called Knowing God one of the top 50 books, the most influential books ever written because of its influence on evangelical Christianity. It is an incredible book, but like its title, Knowing God, and like Blackaby's book, Experience, Experiencing God, and like most other books in sermons, the entire focus is usually on what it looks like for us to know God. But what does it mean for us to be known by God? Not for us to know Him, but for Him to know us. That's what we're talking about today, God's heart for you. And I don't think anything drives home God's heart for you any more than a clear understanding of what it truly means to be known by God. So for the next few moments, that's what I want us to talk about. I want to talk about what few people ever do. Most Christian writers, thinkers, and communicators overlook this beautiful but profound blessing of being known by God. The Apostle Paul didn't. He wrote about it in multiple places. Why? Because it is so integral to the understanding of the gospel. Uh, this idea of being known by God is a foundational truth to the message of the gospel. And I want us to look at one of the places that Paul wrote about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And I want us to look at it in different, same verse in different English translations. All right, let me tell you why I'm going to do it this way. Uh, and for some of you, you know this, but, but please realize that not everybody that walks through the doors of the church knows this, so let me explain this. The New Testament was originally written in Greek, so everything that we read in English is a translation from the original. So the goal is to read in an English translation where very little to nothing is lost in the translation. So we have all of these dozens of translations. If you go to Bible Gateway or to the Bible Bookstore, there are all these different translations of the Bible. Some translations go into the translation from the Greek wanting to have the most literal translation. They don't want anything to be lost and they want it to be as literal as possible, which is a good thing. But the problem is some of the most literal translations are not the most readable. They're hard to read. They're not the easiest to understand. So you have other translations that come in that are not, their goal is not to be the most literal. They, want, they don't want to lose any of the essence of what the original Greek meant, what Paul originally said. But the goal is to make it more readable so a broader audience can understand it and have the impact of Scripture. So some, some go in to be a literal translation, but those are often not readable. Some go in, their goal is not to be literal. Their goal is to become a more readable translation, more understandable translation. So let me read uh, the ESV. So, so let me just say, when I, when I study, I study out of the more literal translations. The ESV, the New American Standard Bible, they're considered more literal translations. When I read to you, um, and when I'm preaching, I often do out of the New Living Translation because those are more readable, easier to understand. So let's begin looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, out of the English Standard Version, a more literal translation. It says this, Paul writes, We know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. So here Paul is writing about what it means to be known by God. If anyone loves God, he is known by God. And it feels like, as you read this, that Paul is placing a greater superiority and a greater weight on being known by God than on knowing God. As a matter of fact, he says our knowledge of God can often puff us up can turn us into religious zealots and Pharisees. But the most humbling thing, the truth that will ultimately melt our hearts is to be aware that this majestic and holy and powerful and infinite God has chosen to know us, that we are known by Him. 
Now, I want to read that same passage out of the New Living Translation, and you have to understand the context uh, of this. There is an argument going on in the church in Corinth about what is moral, about what is right. And Paul is addressing the issue. And there were arrogant know-it-alls in Paul's day, just like there are arrogant know-it-alls in our day. There, There weren't the outlets of radio and social media and all that stuff for them to get their talking points out there. But there were there in Paul's day. So Paul is addressing all these people who think they know a lot. And he says, yes, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 8, yes, we know that all have knowledge about this issue. But while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. But the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. Now the ESV said the person that loves God is the one that is known by God. But here in the New Living Translation, the person that loves God is the one recognized by God. So to be known by God... Is the same thing as being recognized by God. For example, if somebody came to me and showed me a picture of a lot of people, and they said, do you recognize anybody in this photograph? Do you recognize anybody in this picture? My response is probably going to be, yes, I know him and I know her, but I don't know any of the rest of these people. They're going to ask me, who do I recognize? And I'm going to respond by saying, I know so-and-so and so-and-so, but I don't know the rest. Because we interchange who we recognize with who we know. We see them as synonyms. So God recognizes or knows those that love him. Those that are in relationship with him. Which means he can pick you out of a crowd. You are his. You belong to him. He knows you in a different way than he knows everybody else. If you belong to him, he knows you in a different way than he knows everybody else. And he loves you in a deeper and a different way Then he loves everybody else. Now, there's no doubt that the last statement that I just made just didn't set well or sound right to everybody because some of you are arguing in your head right now, but Pastor, God loves everybody, and he does. But he has a greater degree of intimacy and affection and love for his own. There is a degree of affection that God has for his children that he does not have for everybody else. And I can show you this multiple places in Scripture, and one of the clearest is in John chapter 17. The whole chapter of John 17 is a glimpse into the very private. I love the whole chapter. The whole chapter is nothing but a recorded prayer of Jesus, and it is a, a glimpse. We get a little window into the private prayer life of Jesus. This is an intimate moment where Jesus is pouring his soul out to the Father in prayer. The whole chapter. I'm just going to read a segment of the prayer, but I want you to pay attention to the way Jesus refers to his followers compared to those who aren't. I want you to see the commitment to, uh, the dedication to, the affection for those that belong to him. John 17, verse 6, he says, Father, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. So I I, I, I gave, you sent me here. To reveal who you are to them, I have done so. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have now obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. Now notice verse 9. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world. I'm not praying for everybody else. I'm praying for them. I pray for those you have given me, for they are yours. They belong to you. I'm praying for the ones that belong to you. Notice the differentiation. There is a level of affection here. There is a level of intercession. These prayers are not for everybody else. He is praying for his disciples. Now, Jesus goes on in the remainder of that prayer to pray some pretty incredible things over us, but you can't miss the clear delineation in this prayer. His affections in this prayer are not for the everybody else in the world. They are for his disciples, the ones that belong to him. He said, Father, the ones that are yours, for they are yours, the ones that know him. He is praying for his own. Now, there's another passage of Scripture. It's a sobering passage of Scripture that compares what it means to be known by God with those who are not known 
by God. And it's in Matthew's gospel, and these are the words of Jesus. Okay, So if you have a red-letter edition of the Bible, these are going to be written in red in your Bible. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. Listen, but Jesus says, I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me. Or in the more traditional translations, depart from me. I never knew you. Depart from me. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I read Matthew 7, 21, it's a sobering reality to me that there are a lot of religious people who are going through religious motions, doing their religious duties, but they've put their faith in their own efforts, their own moralism, their own religious accomplishments, their own self-righteousness, trusting in themselves, but ultimately not trusting in Jesus. And because of that, they are not known by God. And these kind of people are in for a rude awakening on Judgment Day. They may feel quite secure right now in their religious devotion, but when they stand before Jesus at the judgment, he will say, I never knew you. Depart from me or get away from me. And they will do on Judgment Day what Jesus says they will do in Matthew 7. They will start listing all of their religious accomplishments, all that they have done, how many masses they attended, how many churches they went to when they were baptized, how they were christened. They will start going through all of their religious feats and accomplishments, but none of that matters without a real life changing relationship uh, with Jesus. So none of that will ultimately matter if they are not known by him. The most haunting words any human being would ever hear from God is, I never knew you. That is why the understanding of what it means to be known by God is so important. Do you know him? I guess the bigger question is, are you known by him? This being known by God thing is a really big deal because none of us want to hear the words from God, I never knew you. Now again, some of you are wrestling internally with this question, how does God not know somebody? I mean, isn't God not omniscient? Isn't God not all-knowing? Doesn't he know everything about everybody? So how does Jesus say to somebody, I never knew you? Well, when Jesus says there will be people who approach him on judgment day, and he says to them, depart, for I never knew you, he's not saying, I wasn't aware of you. Sure, he had knowledge of them. Sure, he cared for them. Sure, he even loved them. But they never surrendered their lives to him to a place of entering a very personal relationship. They weren't known to him in an intimate, personal, and relational way. Now, let me illustrate it this way. God's omniscience and his, his knowledge of all things and yet not intimately knowing someone. Let, let, me, let me illustrate it this way. There, there is the omnipresence of God and then there's the manifest presence of God. The omnipresence of God is God is omnipresent. He is everywhere all the, all the same time. Matter of fact, Scripture says, if I make my bed in the grave, you are there. If I go to the highest heavens, you are there. There is nowhere you can go to escape the presence of God. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. And yet those of us that have been around church uh, our lives, or we've been a, a part of the presence of God, th- there have been those moments where we have walked into a room where God has always been, but something unique happens and we pause and just say, oh, I feel Jesus in this room today. I feel the presence of God. We walk into a unique worship environment, and it's just different. God is in that room in a a, a very tangible way, uniquely and differently than he's been at other times. We may weep in that moment. We may fall on our knees in that moment. We may worship in that moment. But there is a very clear sense of the tangible presence of God. And we say, God is here in those moments. Well, God has always been there. 
But what we're feeling is the manifest presence of God. God has always been there. But when he comes into a place in a unique, special way, and we feel his tangible presence in that moment, what we are feeling is the manifest presence of God. So there is the omnipresence of God everywhere all the time. And there are these special moments we are in the presence of God. That is the manifest presence of God. The same can be said about God's omniscience, his knowledge. His knowing. He, in general, is knowledgeable and knows all things. But there is an intimate, personal way that he knows those that belong to him, those that have surrendered their lives to him. There is something different about knowing them, being known by him, and just his general knowledge of all things. In the same way, God has a love, a general love for all people, for God so loved the world. God loves everybody. But there's a difference in the general love God has for everybody and the love that he has for his own. Look, as a pastor, I love you all. But I don't love any of you the way I love my own kids. It's just different. There's an intimacy and a closeness in the relationship a father has with his children as opposed to other relationships. That the father loves his kids in a different way than he loves everybody else. And just while I was thinking about this, have your kids ever tried to get you to tell which one you love the most? Uh, my kids do that. We'll get in a, on a vacation or be having a family moment, um, and, and they'll just say, one of them will say, I know you love me more than you love these other two, uh, and then there'll be this big discussion about who we love the most. And of course, Haley and I are always diplomatic. We make sure we, they know we love them all the same. So, th- so there, is a, there was an incident similar to that that happened in our office this last week. Wanda is our receptionist. She's a beautiful human being, just a, and a gracious, uh, godly woman. A prayer warrior loves church, loves this church, loves Jesus, and 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 last week, um, Monday, and Monday, Tuesday, word got out that Wanda had gone to three different services. So she 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 went to the ten o'clock service in Garland at our Garland campus. Heard Pastor Greg. She attended with her daughter Jasmine down at the ten o'clock service in Garland. That's where Jasmine goes. And then she came to the twelve thirty service and attended with her husband Mel. Uh, her and her her and Mel usually go to the twelve thirty service here. So she attended with Mel. And because she was here and she's bilingual, she decided to stay around and attend the Spanish language service at three, and she heard Pastor John, so she heard the same sermon three times, all right, by three, and so John, when when word got around, I I wasn't in on this, all right, but when word got around, John and and Greg decided, let's just go put some pressure on Wanda, and they got their mean faces on, and they went out to the receptionist and said, we heard you went to all three services, you have to tell us which, who was the better preacher on Sunday? They slapped her desk to intimidate her. And Wanda, as a mother, in all of her wisdom, looked at them and said, I love them all just the same. Okay? She didn't tip her hand one bit. She's a woman of incredible wisdom. I mean, I, I, we love our kids. Okay? And I, I can remember when, when my first one was born, and I, I didn't know how I was going to do this, and God put this incredible love. He gave me the grace and the love for this baby that I held in my arms. I didn't know I had the capacity to love that way. And then when Haley was pregnant with the second child, I thought, how in the world am I going to love this baby that's coming the same way I love the one that I'm currently holding? And yet, when that baby comes along, there's something awakened in your heart, and there's just this love, and it's the same way with every child God entrusts into your care. But it's a different kind of love than what you have for everybody else. The truth is, since the day I surrendered my life to Jesus... I have been fully known and fully loved by God as his child. It is a mind-blowing reality. It is incredibly humbling. It is an overwhelming privilege. And when I fully understand it, there's a security in it. It becomes a stabilizing force in my life. I am known by God, me. The the former thief, the former cheat, the former liar, the former addict, me, I am known by God. And he is not just vaguely aware of me. He is intimately and personally involved in my life. Now, I told you Paul wrote about this being known by God in multiple places. Look at another one with me, Galatians chapter 4. And so that you understand this, uh, Paul wrote Galatians to for people who were not Jews. They were Gentiles. Any non-Jew is considered a Gentile. Christianity first started among the Jews, then spread to the non-Jews. The church at Galatia was made up of non-Jewish, not not ethically Jew. Uh, And so he's writing to them, verse 8 of Galatians 4, but you Gentiles knew God. 
uh, before you Gentiles knew God, you were slaves to so-called gods that, you, that do not even exist, so idols of wood, uh, stone, metal. So now that you know God, and listen to this, or should I say, now that God knows you. So where is Paul placing the greatest emphasis? Not on the fact that the Gentiles in Galatia know God, but the real beauty of it is that God knows you. And because God knows you, why would you ever want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of this world? Again, Paul is making being known by God of greater superiority than that of knowing God. Because the real essence and beauty of knowing God is the fact that God knows me. The great theologian I referred to, J.I. Packer, a few moments ago, affirms Paul's statements. J.I. Packer says it this way, What matters supremely, therefore, is not in the last analysis the fact that I know God, but the larger fact which underlies it, the fact that he knows me. I am graven on the palm of his hands. I am never out of his mind. All my knowledge of him depends on his sustained initiative in knowing me. I know him because he first knew me and continues to know me. He knows me as a friend, one who loves me. And there is no moment that his eye is off me or his attention distracted from me. And no moment, therefore, when his care falters. God takes note of you. He chooses you. You did nothing to earn his favor, but he set his affections on you. He reached down, grabbed his enemies, and made them his friends. It is this truth of the gospel that can sustain us with grace, even in the most difficult times in our lives, if we can let it get into our hearts. John Piper said it this way, deeper than knowing God is being known by God. What defines us as Christians is not most profoundly that we have come to know Him, but that He took note of us and made us His own. Listen, there is no greater love story than this. This is a better Cinderella story than the Cinderella story because this one is not a fairy tale. We bring nothing to the table. We have no pedigree that would attract us to him. We have no earthly reason that he should look our way, but he does. And one of the greatest blessings of being known by God is the stabilizing force that it can bring to our lives when our world is falling apart, when we're going through what many writers have called the dark night of the soul. If you can get, if you're his child, you believe in him, you profess him as Lord, you belong to him, if you can get that in your heart, it will be a stabilizing force in the darkest night of your lives. Listen to these promises from Scripture, from the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 3, Jeremiah says, Yet you know me, Lord, you see me. The words of Jesus in John 10, 27, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Now notice, this is opposed to the ones that are not a sheep, the ones that do not listen to his voice, the ones that don't follow him, the ones that he doesn't know, In a relational sense of the word. My sheep listen to my voice. They follow me. I know them. And then the words of the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse number 12. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully. Even as I am fully known. Here again, Paul is speaking about what it means to be fully known by God. But he's talking about eternity. He's saying, right now I'm a finite being. And when I look to the things of God, it's almost as if I'm looking through a a, a filtered glass. I, I don't know everything. It's almost like it's in part. There's a glass ceiling that is keeping me from knowing everything. But he says, there is going to come a day where my finiteness is going to turn into infiniteness. I'm going to become eternal. That glass ceiling is going to be removed when I see Jesus face to face. And on that day, I will know fully as God already fully knows knows me. This beauty of being fully known by God. If you're a Christ follower, he knows you. 
And he knows what you're going through. He knows every time you bump your elbow on the side of a door and yell out in pain. He sees every accident. He knows when your knees ache so bad at night that you can't sleep. He's aware of the feelings of depression and hopelessness that consume your heart. He knows about every chemo appointment. He was weeping with you in your season of grief. He knows about every injury and every irritation. He sees your despair and he knows how you feel. And if you look historically at the three lowest points in the history of Israel, the three lowest points in the history of Israel, their Egyptian slavery, which lasted hundreds of years, their wilderness wanderings, which lasted 40 years, and their season of exile, which lasted decades. Okay, so, and these three seasons of history were separated by hundreds and hundreds of years. All right, so through this long span of time and every one of those seasons, if you go back and read the Old Testament, the number one thing that God did in every one of those seasons, the number one promise he made during the slavery in Egypt, during the wilderness wanderings, and during their season of exile, the one promise that keeps coming up over and over again is this. I know you. I haven't forgotten you. I am aware of your circumstances. Your trials and tribulations are not overlooked. You are known by God. You may be rejected by the Pharaoh. You may be rejected by Babylon. You may be rejected by the peoples that you meet in your wilderness wanderings. But know that you are known by God. So through history, the sustaining promise is this. You are known by God. And God's desire to know us is the beauty that is in the Christmas story. God is so committed to knowing us that he took on our form and became one of us. So in the incarnation, Jesus came to relate to us. He faced physical, emotional, and spiritual agony in his life and in his death. The one who descended into our human pain is the one who knows and relates to our human pain. We are known by God. He's so into you that Scripture says he knows the very hairs on your head, every single one. He knows about every ache, every wound, every thought, every emotion, every tear, every bad day. Nothing surprises him. And not one element of your life escapes his eye. He is aware of the waves that are crashing down on you today. So here's the challenge. Don't look for your comfort in anyone or anything else. Us trying to find comfort somewhere else would be about as irrational as Cinderella being in the ballroom, being pursued by the prince, and choosing to leave the ballroom to go search for someone else. It would be ridiculous. But this is what we do when we spend our time searching for significance and other things. The king of kings, the creator of this world, has set his affection on us. He knows us. He cares for us. So it would be foolish for us to try to find comfort in all the wrong places. So before I finish today, let me revisit a verse and a statement that I made just a few moments ago. I made this statement a few moments ago, but I don't know that it fully resonated. And I wanted, if, if, I, if, I, if I had to let you leave here with one thought resonating in your heart, this is what I would want you to know when you leave. So I don't want you to miss the depth of this statement. You are fully known and still fully loved. What does it mean to be fully known by God? It means there are absolutely no secrets. You can't hide anything. Everything about you is laid bare. The entirety of your thoughts, your emotions, your intentions, your motivation, literally everything about you is known by Him. To be known by God means there are absolutely no secrets between you and Him. Jeremiah 12 verse 3 says, Yet, You know me, Lord. You see me and test my thoughts. As a matter of fact, he knows us better than we know ourselves. Some of us are fooling ourselves. Scripture says the heart of man is deceitfully wicked, so deceitful that many of us are either ignoring or just never stopping long enough to take a deep look inside our own hearts because we don't want to know the truth about the condition of our own hearts. And yet God knows everything that we lie to ourselves about. He knows everything that we try to hide from 
everybody else. We can wear a mask with people, but we are totally laid bare, naked, and exposed before God. There is something a little scary about that. There is something intimidating and insobering about that to be fully, totally, and completely known by God. But as intimidating and as sobering is the first part of that statement is, the second part of that statement is equally as comforting. You are fully known and still fully loved. That's the beauty of the gospel. He knows me fully, and yet he loves me fully. I hope you get that. The one who knows everything there is to know about you is the only one who loves you totally, completely, and unconditionally. It is hard for us to understand this. And then once we get it in our head, it is hard for us to actually believe it. But once you do, you start to grasp the power of the gospel. You finally find the sense of security and stability that your heart longs for as a son and daughter of God. You see, we hide things from people because we're afraid that if they really knew us, that they wouldn't love us. If all the secrets of our life were made public, we're afraid that people would reject us. So we live with masks. We are not vulnerable. We live with the world only knowing a part of us. But this truth that God knows all of us and still fully loves us is what drives out fear. Our relationships with other human beings are driven by fear. The fear of rejection. So we hide and we duck and and we we keep masks on because we're afraid. If they really know us, they're not going to love us or they're going to reject us. But the scripture says, perfect love casts out all fear. And the fact that I am fully known and yet at the same time fully loved is the thing that brings security. When he sees all there is to see about me, he doesn't shrink back in disappointment. He continues to pursue me in spite of what he knows, and there is an unfailing love that doesn't stop despite me being totally laid bare before him. You are fully known and still fully loved. Beauty, security, grace, stability. Look, any of us that have ever faced addiction, or those of you that have tried to just grow and mature in any area of your life, You will never change if the motivation of your change is driven by fear. Never. The the change, if it is driven by fear, will not be long term. The people who come to Jesus because they're afraid of him or they're afraid of the consequences, they may make a decision in the moment, but a lot of times that decision is not sustained. But when that decision is motivated by love, the the, the change can last forever. Forever. Those of us that have struggled when when we're trying to change, we fear in our our marriage. The reason we're trying to change is because we fear a divorce and we're, we're worried about the consequences. When our motivation is driven by fear, the change in that relationship isn't going to be long term. When our motivation is driven by love, the change will last. What you have to know is God's love drives out all fear, security foundation, stability. Over the next few months, as we focus on this for the one theme, I I do want you to let your heart be burdened for those far from God. I do want you to let your heart be awakened for the one who gave his life for you. But I want you to let your heart become aware of and alive to the reality that you are known by God. He has a heart for you. You are his one. As I was preparing this message this week, I just kept asking myself, what what would I want you to experience in response to this message today? And what I really would want you to experience is the Father's embrace. Some of us in this room today feel distant from God. Maybe because of our own decisions, our own life choices, we're asking, how could God love me in this condition? How could God want me? The reality is, He does. He wants you. He pursues you. 
And that is the overwhelming reality of grace. So regardless of what you've done, regardless of where you've been, regardless of who you are, I want you to just be in his presence for a moment and I want you to sense his embrace. I I didn't grow up in an environment that had me understand a God who took pleasure over me, who was madly in love with me, who wanted me, who pursued me. I grew up with this image of God that was always angry, just waiting on me to blow it. It was a righteous God and he is righteous. But in his righteousness, he was looking down his nose in condescension at me because I could never live up to the standard. And it was all, I was always blowing it. I was never living up to the standard. And I always had this image of a God who was always angry at me. And yet over and over again, when I read in scripture, there is this grace, this mercy, this compassion that is new every morning. It is never failing. And I just encourage you today to be embraced by God. Be embraced by the Father. He, if you've given your life to Him, if you have committed your life to Jesus Christ, just, just realize you are His. You belong to Him. And He wants to put His arms around you today. I want you to feel the Father's embrace. I also am going to ask the prayer team in a moment to make themselves available because if you belong to Him, there's not a reluctant Father in Heaven waiting to meet your needs. There is an eager Father in Heaven. He's pursuing you. Uh, the, uh, just the other day, I'll give you a kind of a rudimentary uh, illustration. I have a grown son who has a job. Okay, He's a big boy. He can take care of himself. But he was supposed to have been off an hour and a half earlier. We had not heard from him. He wasn't answering phone calls or text. Uh, I got worried. Uh, I was already in town, so I went over to where he worked. It was only 15 minutes from where I was. And I pulled up in the parking lot, you know. I'm checking on him. Uh, I pulled up about the time he got off. He walked out and said, what are you doing here? I said, well, nobody could, nobody, you know, he can't use his phone while he's at work. And so uh, nobody heard from you. So I was just checking to make sure you were all right. And of course he said, well, that's awesome. While you're here, can I have your credit card? I need to go get something to eat. Uh, (laughs) Now my pursuit of him was driven by worry. It was love, but it was driven by worry. Uh, And he benefited from my pursuit. (laughs) There was a blessing in my pursuit. Look, I was an eager father. I I, I cared for him. And I wanted the best for him. And, And your father is so much more in love with you than I have the capacity to love my own kids. He's not a reluctant father wanting to give you his best. He is an eager father wanting to... He's pursuing you today, not out of worry out of love, not out of fear, but out of love. And he wants to embrace you today, and he wants to give you all of his good and perfect gifts. So if you have a need today, let us pray with you, because you approach an eager father, pursuing you to give you his best. You are his own. You belong to him. Would you stand with me all over this place today? And I'm going to ask the prayer team if they would to make themselves available to serve you. And for those of you that need prayer, let us join with you in faith. For those of you that don't respond for a need today, I encourage you just to, to stay in his presence for the next few moments and feel his embrace. Father, I pray a blessing over your people today. A blessing, I pray, at the end of almost every service. But I, I believe it is your heart. I pray it because it's in your word, but I believe it's what you want for them. I believe you want to bless them and keep them. I believe you want to make your face shine down upon them. I believe you want to be gracious to them. I believe you want to turn your countenance their direction. And I believe you want to give them peace. Because you are a good, good father. And we are your own. And today, may we feel the stability, the security, the embrace of the Father's love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. These altars are open. God bless you.